Hello! In this video, we are going to talk a bit about the form of the temple in the archaic Greek world. So let me start my slideshow with all my pictures. Okay, so we talked about how in the late early Iron Age, right, in early Iron Age 2, we begin to see the emergence of the Greek temple, this monumental Greek temple, like the Temple of Hera at Samos. Uh, and in the Archaic period, the building of temples continues to increase and become more common. Uh, it, this will continue in the Classical period as well, to the point where the temple is really the most, most common monumental public building that we find in the Greek world. Uh, and so while there are other kinds of monumental buildings that, that are built, our focus in this course when we talk about Greek architecture is largely on temples and temple structure. Okay. Um, so around this time, the standard form of the temple is developing. So I want to start by looking at what that standard layout is and the standard elevation and, and the parts of the temple um, in the Greek world. So I'm going to start with the layout and I have this um, picture that I've blown up too large and it becomes very pixelated of essentially a very standard Greek temple. Now they don't all look like this. There's a lot of variety that's possible, but a lot of them have these parts. So the um, the entire thing is built on a small platform. It's like a two or three step up platform. That's the base of it. Uh, and then you have the, the actual structure built on top of it. And the structure has multiple rooms usually. It's got a front porch and the front porch is usually held up with columns and it has an entryway that leads into the main room of the temple. The main room is known as the cella, and this is generally where the statue of the god or goddess is kept and votive offerings are placed. It is a small room. It's not meant for public use. Only the priests and priestesses are allowed in here. There may be an extra room at the back called the adaton, which in Greek is like the hidden room. It's like an extra room in there, and it's used for different purposes. It could be a treasury where you keep like old votives that are very valuable. Um, it could be used for ritual purposes. Certain rites are done there, so it can have various uses. Uh, and then there is often a back porch, again, held up here by two columns, but the back porch does not connect into the cella. It's, it's always walled off. So that's the actual building itself. It's pretty simplistic in its design. The entire thing is surrounded by columns on all sides, um, and it forms this open walkway, which is known as the peristyle, right? Um, and that entire thing is covered by the roof. The roof um, goes over the entirety of the columns and um, the whole actual building itself, and so it covers the whole thing. Now, like I said, there are varieties in layouts, and I show you this um, next picture, not to, to say you have to memorize all of them, but to give you a sense of the variety. You can have ones without a full peristyle, without a back porch, without an adaton. You can have extra peristyle. You can have, you know, double, uh, sort of uh, what's called dipteral, double uh, peristyle going around. Um, you can have a circular temple. It's usually called a tholos. So there is variety, but the basic temple that uh, and the, the pieces that a lot of, had, that a lot of uh, temples share are on the previous slide. Now, let's talk about the elevation, kind of like what it looks like on the outside. So like I said, you have a, a roof that covers the whole thing, that covers the building itself and the column. So it, it covers that entire size. Um, the roof is gabled, right? It comes to a point at the top. Um, and so uh, it forms on either end a, a facade. Uh, and this are these are the basic parts of the facade. So you have the row of columns that comes up at that point. Um, it is holding up this kind of rectangular slab, which is actually in two pieces, um, what is known as the architrave is the lower part and the frieze is the upper part. Uh, and then above it, you get this triangular face that's made by the end of the roof. And that is known as the pediment. I know that it says tympanon and stuff here. It is the, the pediment. Well, the pediment's really specifically this bit inside. Um, so you have the pediment, you have a frieze and an architrave, you have the columns themselves, uh, and then you have your base, the, the crepitima is the steps, the stylobates, the base, we don't have to know all of these terms. But this is the basic idea, um, that when you look on the ends of the temple, you have columns holding up this rectangular slab, and then above it, this sort of triangular slab of the pediment. Okay, um, so... Um, I, I want to point out these pieces because what we begin to see at this time is that temples are becoming a bit bigger, a bit more complex. So how do they more complex? Well, for one thing, they are being made out of more expensive materials. Earlier temples are made from stone foundation, mud brick wall, um, wooden columns, and now we're beginning to see 
limestone and marble um, and much more precious stone being used to build these temples because the Greek communities have more wealth in them that they can spend um, on, on temples and communal projects. There's also an influence of Egyptian temple building where they do similar things and they use similar materials. Uh, and so we begin to see the emergence of these marble and limestone temples. Uh, but that's not the only way we can sort of pour wealth into a temple. The other way is to decorate it. And so the decorations uh, generally involve relief sculpture and those relief sculptures can appear on these ends, in the pediment and across the frieze and architrave. Now, not every temple has decorations. You tend to need money in order to have them. Uh, and so you may have no decorations. Um, you may have just a few. Not everything is decorated. Um, or you'll end up with the Parthenon where every last piece is decorated, right? And we'll talk about that when we get there. Um, but, but this is what tends to happen. Um, so I, before we get into some ex specific examples of temples, I want to share the two major temple styles. So we said they all have the same basic layout generally, the same basic um, facade generally, but there actually are two different styles of temple that emerge, um, what are called orders when we're talking about temples, the Doric order and the Ionic order. The Doric order we find more in Greece um, and Sicily, the Ionic order we tend to find more like in Asia Minor, the Greeks living there, but it doesn't have to be that strict. Um, we can find examples of each in the other places as well. So the biggest difference between the Doric and the Ionic order have to do with what the facades look like. So let's just take a quick look at each of them. So with the Doric order, the column is a bit better, it's a bit thicker, uh, and the top of it, what's known as the capital, is very plain. It just sort of flares up into a little disc at the top. It does not have any kind of base to it, right? It just connects directly to the, the platform that the temple is built on. So it's fairly, um, it's, a, it's a thicker column, it's fairly plain uh, capital and no base. Um, above it, we said you have the architrave and the frieze. The architrave is very plain, nothing's on it. The frieze is actually made up of alternating panels. So it alternates between a triglyph panel, where they have these sort of three lines coming down, and a metope panel. This metope panel can be plain or it can be decorated with a sculptural relief. Um, and then above it is the, um, the actual end of the roof and you have the pediment here that again can be decorated. The Ionic Order, on the other hand, um, is a bit different. Um, so the columns of the Ionic Order, a little slimmer and, and taller, they have a base that they are connected to that stands between the column itself and the platform that's being built on. And they have a capital that is more uh, convoluted. Uh, it's a volute, volute um, what's known as a volute. It is the scroll design on either end, right? So it has a, a much more complex capital. Um, when you get up to the frieze and the, uh, the architrave and the frieze, the architrave is split into three lines, right? And so instead of being one big empty rectangular surface, um, it's split up into these sort of three pieces. And then you have the frieze itself, and the frieze itself sometimes is carved. It doesn't have the triglyph and metope pattern, but sometimes you do see carvings on it. And then above it is the pediment. Now there's lots of other things here that you don't need to be familiar with. Um, you can really get pretty technical and break down the, the temple into lots and lots of pieces. The only other thing I do wanna point out that can really show up on either Doric or Ionic temples is what's known as the Akrotirion. So the Akrotirion is essentially little statues you place on top. It doesn't just have to be on the ends. It could be very the very top where the, the roof meets at the top, um, but these little statues that just pop, they pop on top of the temple um, on either side of the, uh, the facade. Um, okay, so that's the, the sort of the main features, the decorative features of the temple facades and the differences between the Doric and the Ionic. I mean, if you want to make a real quick judgment, you just look at this capital. It's the easiest way to do it. This plain capital is Doric, this scroll capital is, is Ionic. It's as simple as that. Okay, so with this in mind, I do want to look at a couple temples, really two or three temples, of the archaic period. We're not going to look at a ton, um, and the reason for this is that while there were many temples built in the archaic period of Greece, most of them do not survive in any good order, any good shape. Uh, most of them have burned down or been knocked down and replaced by later buildings, and we have almost nothing of them um, except descriptions, so it is a little bit difficult to talk about archaic temples. When we get to the classical period, there'll be tons that we can look at, but for now it's a little tough. Um, so I want to start by talking about the Temple of Artemis on Corfu. Corfu is an island of Greece. It's actually off the western coast. 
Um, and this is a temple that was built there around 580 BC, so pretty early on here, um, dedicated to the goddess Artemis. It's it's gone. It's pretty well gone. Uh, so this is just a picture of what the um, facade would have looked like. So we can see immediately, this is Doric. We have Doric columns with their little capitals. We have the, the triglyph and metope is also another good indication of Doric, and the very plain uh, architrave below it, um, and then the pediment above. So uh, the Temple of Artemis at Corfu was decorated. We know that the Metopes were probably decorated. We found a we uh, found a piece of one that seems to show Achilles fighting the warrior Memnon, uh, a scene from the Trojan War. Uh, but that's about it. But again, it, it's very old and it's been gone for a long time, so we can't expect to find everything. Uh, and then we have the pedimental sculptures, which you can see here. I've got some close-ups we'll look at in a moment. Uh, this is the first temple we know of to have pedimental sculpture. Now, other temples may have had it, but we just don't have the evidence for it. Um, this is the first one we know of. And they are dedicated in high relief, right? So they are almost, uh, they're kind of coming out from the plane of the pediment um, here. You can see some, some curve to them, right, um, as they kind of emerge from the pediment. So these things that we see decorating temples, the scenes on metopes and pediments and so forth, come from myth, right? We do not generally see historical or everyday scenes. There are exceptions, of course. Generally, though, we see scenes and people from myth and legend. What we have here is Medusa, the Gorgon. Right, the Gorgon, if you're not familiar with them from myth, they are these um, monster women with uh, snake hair. Uh, they are a very common symbol in ancient Greece. You see Gorgon faces everywhere because they're supposed to ward off evil, so they're lucky. Um, so here she is. She's also, she has wings originally. I don't think you can see much of the wings. You can see the snakes coming off her head. She's got fangs as well. That's really common on Gorgons too. Um, so this is Medusa. This position she's in, this kind of weird position, is meant to indicate running because in the myth, Medusa, the monster, is killed by the Greek Greek hero um, Perseus. So probably she's meant to be running from Perseus here. She is flanked by this little guy here. Um, uh, this is probably Chryseor, who is her son. Pegasus was probably over here because when Medusa dies and Perseus cuts off her head, her two children, uh, Pegasus and Chryseor, emerge. Uh, so that's probably who she's flanked by. Um, but they are, are much smaller, and it's probably probable that they're much smaller because they're, they're kids, and the ancient Greeks don't do kids well. They just make tiny people. Another factor here may be that the pediment gets smaller as it goes down, and the Greeks don't really know how to compensate for this yet, so they just make the figures tinier and tinier as they go uh, along. They're not all on the same scale. They, they haven't quite mastered that. Um, so we have some other picture parts of this pediment as well. We have, well, here we can go. We can take a closer look. Here's Medusa, her snaky hair. Um, here's Chryseor. There is a bit of wing here. I don't know if you can you can quite tell. There's like feathers down here that survive. Um, but there's also these panthers that flank her on either side. Um, just seated. They're not up to anything. You can see their detail though of their musculature. It looks very much like the kind of the cool roast detail of musculature. And they also have these little whirls on them to show their hair, um, which is a, a neat feature if not particularly realistic. Um, we also see some other figures. Here on the left side, there is a probably a dead warrior. That's probably what this is, a person laying down who having been killed, and a seated person who seems to be um, under attack. Someone is attacking this seated person. On the right side, we have this little scene of a beardless man attacking a, a much larger person. And so the question becomes, what in the world is going on here? First of all, this is a temple to Artemis. Where is Artemis? She's nowhere to be found. We have instead uh, Medusa and all these weird figures. And so there's been a lot of questions about why Medusa here? Is she associated with Artemis in some way? What about these other figures? Um, there has been a guess here that maybe this is the depiction of what's known as the Titanomachy or the Gigantomachy, which are ancient battles that the gods supposedly fought against their predecessor gods, their parents, um, and then also against the giants who were a race of monsters that tried to destroy them. And so in that reading, this might be young Zeus killing a giant, for instance. But there are other interpretations as well. It's, it's not very clear because we don't have a lot of other evidence to, to help us understand how to interpret this. Um, the other temple I'll just point out here is, because uh, I wanted to show you an Ionic one, is the Temple of Artemis at Ephesus, which is a major city in Asia Minor. It is long gone, and in fact, this represents the second temple at the site. That one was destroyed in 373, and then a third, uh, I'm sorry, in um, 356 BC, it, an arsonist actually burned it down, and then it was rebuilt as a third temple. Um, but uh, this is a reconstruction of what it may have looked like. So it is an Ionic temple. You can see the volutes pretty easily. Um, and we don't have metopes and triglyphs, and it was 
incredibly heavily decorated. Um, it was commissioned by King Croesus of Lydia, um, which was the kingdom um, in that region, who was an incredibly wealthy man. He wanted it to be kind of the biggest and greatest temple in the Greek world. Uh, and so it has uh, this kind of double peripteral, this, this double peristyle. There are actually uh, the, the bottoms of these um, columns have been decorated with relief sculpture, which we don't really see elsewhere. The pediment is completely decorated. Um, so all sorts of touches, the acroterion, right, which are up here at the edges, all sorts of touches. But again, like I said, this is a reconstruction. We don't actually have um, the, the temple surviving. We have bits of a later version of the temple. Um, but this gives you a sense of what an archaic Ionic temple may have looked like. Um, okay, so we're going to stop there with our discussion of temples. In our next video, we'll look at the city of Athens in particular and some of the monuments, temples, and otherwise that show up there in the archaic period. All right, thanks for watching. Bye.